Well, good morning, everyone. It's so, it is great to see each of you here today. I'm grateful for the opportunity to take the baton from Scott this morning as we continue our Christmas series entitled The Fathers of Jesus. Last week, as you recall, we looked at the life of Abraham and the faith that Abraham exhibited in response to the promises that he gave to him. We learned that when Abraham doubted, God showed him the stars. And we also learned that when we doubt, God shows us his scars. This morning, we're going to look at another ancestor, another father of Jesus found in the Old Testament. We're going to look at the life of David and his life before he became the king of Israel. Now, David was born in Bethlehem of Judea. He was anointed in Bethlehem of Judea Judea by Samuel that he would someday be the future king. He's like a young little lad, maybe 12, 10 years old when he was anointed. You're going to be the king of Israel someday. And this is the same Bethlehem that Micah wrote about in prophesying the arrival of Jesus onto the scene in Bethlehem of Judea. So Micah writes 700 years before Christ about another king who's going to come and be born in Bethlehem of Judea, and that would be Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So there's a parallel here between David and Jesus. They're both kings. David, the king of Israel, and Jesus, the king above all kings, the king of kings, Lord of lords. We read that prophecy in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But as for you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you will go forth for me to be a ruler in Israel. His going forths are from long ago, from the days of eternity. So we're going to be looking at an event that happened in David's life that many of you probably are familiar with. It's an event that has coined a phrase that we use from time to time when we read about an underdog overcoming a tremendously gigantic rival or a heavily favored rival. We're going to look at the true story of David and Goliath. When people, the Israelites in this instance, were rescued from a bleak future of being enslaved by the Philistines. I don't know about you, but I like to read, I love to read rescue stories. Rescue stories. I, like, remember, I think in 2018, the soccer players in Thailand who were rescued from that cave, they went in there, oh, that was a great rescue story. Was, I love to read that, when successful rescue stories. You know? Or there's a scuba diver, his name is Dan Carlock. In 2004, he was scuba diving with a group of people off of Newport Beach, and he comes up out of the water, and his scuba diving buddies had gone. They had left them behind in the middle of the ocean. They had thought everyone was in their boat, so they just left them there off four miles off of Newport Beach. And Dan prayed, God, I'm going to die out here. Please send help. And just at that time, if you're familiar with the story, there was a, there was a boat, of, and there were some Boy Scouts doing um, maneuvers or doing some exercise in that boat to get their, their um, badge. And they had been diverted somehow to go in this direction that led into the path of Dan Carlock. And the Boy Scouts were looking, hey, there's some guy over there bobbing his head in the water. There's like, what, really? Oh, and Dan Carlock was pulled out of the water that day in, off of Newport Beach. Rescue stories. I love rescue story. Hearing Amor up here on, a few weeks ago share a, of her experience of, as a compassion child strikes me as a rescue story. Rescuing children from a cycle of poverty is a rescue story. Rescuing children to help, hopefully, they will have a better life. And that Compassion Weekend led to almost 50 kids being sponsored. 50 kids rescued from a cycle of poverty. We're told that by Compassion that a church our size, usually when they have a Compassion Weekend, a church our size usually sponsored four to five children. And there were some people from the outside who came and sponsored children, but the majority of those 50 people who are children who are sponsored were from this church. And kudos to you, my friends. Kudos to you for, for being a part of um, helping children, helping rescue them. So let's look at this rescue account. It's in 1 Samuel, um, 1 Samuel chapter 17 in the Old Testament. The Israelites were led by King Saul, and so they had gathered on one side of the valley of of this valley called Alay. So here's King Saul and the Israelites, and on the other side of the valley 
were their arch nemesis, the Philistines, the Philistine army. The Philistines sent their number one warrior out to address the Israelites. Now, you know, his name was Goliath. He was like nine foot, nine inches tall, taller than I could jump. He was nine foot, nine inches tall. He wore a coat of armor that weighed more than many of us, 125 pounds. He had a matching bronze helmet and javelin and a spear, and the spearhead weighed 15 pounds. I mean, this guy was a big dude. And they sent Goliath out to address the Israelites. And we read, starting with verse 8. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Then the Philistine said, This day I defy the armies of Israel. Give, give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. They were dismayed and terrified. And the passage goes on to say that Goliath did this. Can you imagine if you had a neighbor who did this every day and every night for 40 days in a row? Every night, every morning, he'd come out and say the same thing. Every night, he'd come out and say the same thing. It's like, man, the Israelites were terrified of this guy. They were intimidated by this, by this man. Why 40 days and 40 nights? Why, why were they doing that? Well, um, one reason they probably had to stand off for 40 days and 40 nights is neither side was willing to give the other the higher ground, the advantage of attacking, so that the, neither side was willing to give up the higher ground. Probably another reason why it was 40 days is the number 40 is very significant in the Bible. When you read, there's numerous times from Old Testament to New Testament where you read the, about the number 40. And the number 40 usually is revolving around a transition time. Look at the great flood. So when God chose to flood the earth, he caused rain to go for 40 days and 40 nights. The Israelites, they were wandering around the, the wilderness for 40 years before they entered the promised land. Jesus, before he began his public ministry, was in the wilderness 40 days and 40 nights before he became his public ministry. And this, after Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he hung around for 40 days before he ascended into heaven. Oh, it's kind of slippery up here on this snow. <laughs> so in this instance of the 40 days and 40 nights, um, the 40 might be pointing to the changing of the guard. Remember, uh, David had been uh, anointed by Samuel. You're going to be the king of Israel someday. So perhaps these 40 days and 40 nights was leading, was symbolizing, hey, there's going to be a change in the guard soon. Saul out, David in. But continuing on, on the scene. Onto the scene comes David. David, who a few years earlier, as I shared, had been anointed to become the king. So David was the eighth son of this man named Jesse. He's the youngest son, youngest child. Now, in Numbers chapter 1, verse 3, it says you need to be at the age of 20 to become a member of the Israelite army. And David had three brothers who were members of the army. So in trying to deduce how old David was, we can logically or we can, we can uh, think through it, the ramifications of him being the youngest, youngest child, youngest boy, and he was probably around 16 years old. Maybe a little younger, but let's say he was my, like my son's age, 16 years old. So the 16-year-old guy comes onto the scene. We read in verse 20. And he was talking with them. Goliath, the Philistine champion from, Garth, from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. Now, the Israelites have been saying, do you see this man? He keeps coming out. He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from paying taxes in Israel. David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine, Philistine, Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? 
Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Oh, 16-year-old kid, you know, he's saying this. Who's, what's going to be done about this? It says that when David, what David said was overheard, and they brought David to King Saul. Continue reading in verse 32. David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go against this Philistine and fight him. You're only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off the sheep from the flock, I went after it. I struck it down and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the Lord, of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. So David, he reminds Saul, I'm a shepherd. I went after the bear and the lion, and the Lord delivered me from those paws, and he will deliver me from the paw or the hand of this Philistine. David was a shepherd as a lad, and we know that later on his descendant Jesus would be known as the good shepherd. The good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. The good shepherd. And I imagine that David, during the course of his life, sitting out there watching the sheep, would write, he would write many songs. In fact, we know this because look at, look at the Old Testament. More than half of the Psalms in the middle of the Bible were written by David. He was quite a songwriter. And he, I, I can imagine him out there writing these songs, songs about God. I share a couple verses with you here that share about his confidence in God. Psalm 34, verse 4 and 5. I sought the Lord, and He answered me. He delivered me from some of my fears. No, He delivered me from all of my fears. Those who look to Him are radiant with joy, and their faces shall never be ashamed. That's a beautiful, that's a beautiful song. I sought the Lord, He answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. In Psalm 121, verses 1 and 2, I lift my eyes up to the mountains. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. You can imagine David watching the sheep, looking to the mountains, seeing a bear take one of his sheep away, or a lion, lion said, oh, where's my help going to It's going to come from the Lord. He's going to help me. I'm going after that. I'm going after that bear. I'm going to save that sheep. So after deciding not to wear the armor that Saul suggested he give, that su- suggested that he wear, David took in his, ha- in his hand five smooth stones from the stream. He put them in a pouch, in a shepherd's pouch. And with a sling in his hand, he approached Goliath. And Goliath, you know the story, he looked at David and said, am I a dog that you should send little sticks to fight me? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Come here, he said, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. I like what David said back. You come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into my hands." David makes a very confident statement here. He doubles down on Goliath's threat. Remember, Goliath said, oh, I'm going to give your flesh to the animals. They're going to, the animals are going to eat your flesh. And David goes, oh, yeah, I'm going to give the flesh of the Philistine army to the animals today. Perhaps David looked to the mountains surrounding him as he prepared to go into battle with Goliath. And he grew confident knowing that the Lord was going to be with him says as Goliath moved closer to attack that David moved closer to Goliath 
and he pulled one of those stones out of his pouch and he slung it. I don't know if he's right-handed or left-handed. He might have been left-handed. So he's boom! And it struck David, uh, Goliath, right here in the forehead and he died. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone without a sword in his hand. And it says that he took hold of the Philistine's sword and he drew it from the sheath and he killed, after he killed him, he cut off Goliath's head with the sword. And when the Philistines saw that what had happened to their fallen hero, it says they turned and they ran. The Israelites, they were dismayed and fearful as they faced the Philistines giant and their giant. They were very scared, the Israelites were, and they fled from him in great fear. It says they fled with great fear. Goliath's victory would have led the Israelites to become enslaved to the Philistines. But David wasn't afraid. David knew that he had a helper. And his helper was God. And when you and, when you and I are afraid, we need not be afraid. Because we know that we have a helper. Our helper is God. The sheep in this story that David talks about were in need of a rescue from a lion and a bear. And David acted to rescue those sheep. The Israelites were in need of rescue from the Philistines and Goliath. And David acted to rescue the Israelites. And we, us, all of us in this room, everyone in the world, we are all at one time in need of rescue. We cannot rescue ourselves no matter how hard we try. We need someone like David to rescue us. We need the other king that was born in Jerusalem to rescue us. We need Jesus Christ to rescue us. Ephesians chapter 2, Paul paints a picture of what we need to be rescued from. He paints a picture of what you and I were all like at one time in our lives. I'm not saying we're all like this now, but at one time in our life, this depicts you and I. Philippians 2. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. You lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, having no hope and without God in this world. Paul paints it. Ephesians 2. You can read it all later on. But he paints you are in need of rescue, my friends. This is what it was like. You are on the road, as Jesus said, on the road that leads to destruction. We are separated from Christ. We're without God, without hope in this world. The Bible is crystal clear that we all sin. And the wages, what we earn from our sin is death. And we all at one, night, one time in our life, all of us need to be rescued from that path that we're on. And that is God. That is what God has done for us through His Son, Jesus. God gives us a strong rescuer. Paul writes about what Jesus rescued us from in Colossians chapter 1. For He rescues us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and we have the forgiveness of sin. God gives us a strong rescuer from a hopeless spiritual condition that all of us at one time or another are in. A situation that we cannot, we never could rescue ourselves from. <clears throat> when the World Trade Center collapsed to the ground on the dreadful day of September 11th, 2001, there were more than 3,000 people who died. But a few of those who were buried under the rubble miraculously survived the toppling of the towers. Two of these individuals were Will Jimeno and John McLaughlin. They were a pair of Port Authority employees who responded to the attacks, and they were on the bottom floor when the, when the tower began to fall. They raced to an elevator shaft, hid there, and amazingly survived all this rubble falling down upon them. They were trapped without water. They were breathing smoke-filled air. Both Will and John had little hope for survival. Will shares this time in a book that he wrote, or in, a, in a, a story that was written about him. Fireballs started falling into the hole, literally balls of fire. These fireballs kept coming towards me, and I, I couldn't move. I knew they were burning my arm, 
and I knew that if they caught my uniform, I would burn alive. Fireballs coming from the destruction. I kept yelling, Sarge, I'm going to burn. And he said, keep focused. Somehow the fireballs eventually went out. But the terror would continue. They had, a, they had a fallen comrade who had died, who had died by their side. And their fallen comrade had shot his gun, had shot a bullet into the air in hopes that someone would hear that gun. Well, that gun was lying close by to Will and John. And as the fireballs hit the gun, the gun heated up. As far as hit that, and the gun heated up, it says bullets were discharged from the gun. All of a sudden, it was pow, pow, pow. The gun is shooting above my head, says, says Will. All I could do is take my hand and put it over my face, hoping that a bullet wouldn't go through. But I knew better than that. I knew that I would die if I got hit. But somehow, some way, the gun finished firing, and I was still alive. Can you imagine? I can't imagine being in that situation. They were in need of a rescuer, right? They were in need of rescue. And as they lay there pinned under a mountain of debris, something was stirring inside the heart of an accountant in Connecticut hundreds of miles away, an accountant they never met. David Carnes, who had spent 23 years active duty in the United States Marine Corps, was watching the TV, was watching the TV, He's watching the scene play out in front of him, and he said, I'm going to do something. He got up from his computer screen, spreadsheet. He told his, went and told his boss, I won't be back for a while. He went to the barber shop. I want a high and tight haircut, back, like back in the day, got a high and tight haircut. He went to his closet. He pulled out a pair of uh, marine fatigues that he had kept, kept them pressed, put them on. He went to his church. He asked his pastor and church members, can you pray for me? Pray that I could find someone to be, to be rescued in this rubble because I'm going. Then he got in his car, and he traveled at speeds of up to 120 miles per hour from Connecticut to Manhattan, up to 120 miles per hour, and he got there. And so as he got there, um, the rescue uh, crews had been called off of the pile. Too much stuff was shifting around, so they'd been called off the pile. No, it's too dangerous to be out there right now. Off the pile now. David, wearing his uniform, he wore that uniform thinking, maybe this will have some clout. I'll be able to get by some people. And he did. And he found a way onto the, onto the search area. And he saw another Marine also looking for survivors. Hey, come join me. And him and this other Marine went walking through this dangerously, dangerous area looking for survivors. They climbed over the tangled, tangled steel and they began looking into these voids. They said, United States Marines, is anyone down there? And you know who was down there. Will and John were down there. And finally, quiet, quiet, they heard some tapping. They heard some, a voice from down there in the void. They said, there's someone down there. Man, first time I read this account, it brought, gave me goosebumps. I was crying. I wasn't crying, but I almost cried. I said, man, look at this. You can hear us tap. So, several hours later, Will and John were pulled out of that wreckage, alive. They were the 18th and 20th people out of 20 people that they found in that wreckage alive. They're the 18th and 19th persons to be found. And all because David Carnes took off his suit and he put on his rescue fatigues and he stepped into the despair that's called Ground Zero. And if you look at it, and that's in the same way God took off his royal robe 2,000 years ago. And he came into this world. And Jesus stepped into a dark and depraved culture. And he served us. And we were buried in the depths and rubble of our own foolishness with zero chance of pulling ourselves out of our own sin. And God sent us his rescuer. God gives us a strong rescuer. So I ask you, and probably 90% of you in this room have done this already, but ask the 10% who may have not. Embrace your rescuer. Embrace your rescuer. My friends, have you been rescued yet? 
Have you been pulled out of the dark spiritual rubble? Does your life have hope now? Are you walking a path that leads to life rather than a broad road that leads to destruction? We all need to be rescued once. So I ask you, call out to him today to be rescued today. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, 10, how you can be rescued. He wrote this, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be rescued. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Call upon the Lord. Hear his voice. He's calling for you. He's saying, I'm calling you. Do you want to be rescued? The kids we're sharing today, God has chosen you. Do you hear his voice? Is he saying, I want to rescue you today? If you, if you hear his voice, embrace him. Embrace your rescuer. He's the only one who can do it. He's the only one who can rescue us. So though, I'm going to speak to you. Those of us who have been rescued, I'm going to share with you what we need to do. Okay, there's a lot of things we need to do. I'm just going to share maybe three. Three. Point others to the rescuer. Point others to Jesus Christ. William Booth was the founder of the Salvation Army, and he said this, Look, don't be deceived by appearances. Men and things are not what they seem. All who are not on the rock are in the sea. What he meant by this, there's this picture. There's this picture of people on the rock, and the rock depicts that's supposed to be Jesus Christ. And he said, all people are not on the rock. There's so many people in the sea who need to be rescued still. Point people. Others to the rescuer. Some people don't want to be rescued. They don't think they need to be rescued. Or they're too prideful to ask for help. A few years ago, a bunch of us were at Magic Island and um, there's a baptism. We had a baptism there. And I remember, I think my son was four, you know, and they said, hey, a bunch of them wanted to swim to that, that uh, wall out there, Magic Island. So yeah, okay. Well, go, go with your son. Go with him. Okay. So I'm swimming out there. I'm not a good swimmer. I go, oh, I think I can make it. So halfway there, I said, oh, son, why don't you go swim with Uncle Trevor or Uncle Kevin over there? Because I don't think, so I made it to that wall, right? And then coming back from that wall, coming back to the shore, I left before everyone else because I didn't want people to see what a crappy swimmer I was. So I'm just swimming, right? And so I go, holy cow, I don't think I can make it to shore. And I, I, this is my wife. Told, my wife saw me from afar. And she goes, what is that man doing? What is he doing? She just kind of turned away her face from looking. And I'm, I'm, I'm just going like this. Oh, and with each, with each thing, I'm, I'm going, I think I'm going to die out here. I don't, I don't think I'm going to make it to shore. Oh, there's a lifeguard. Oh, there's a lifeguard there. I could cry out to that lifeguard for help. No, I'm not going to cry out. To, I don't want to be seen as deep, uh, needing help from anybody. I tell you, I barely made it to shore. I didn't cry for. I barely made it to shore. I was breathing hard the, for many, for a long time. My arms were dead. I said, Why did I do something stupid like that? You know. Said, and why didn't I cry out for help? Because of this. So often, our hardness of heart, our pride, doesn't allow us to be rescued. Right? Like, I was afraid what people think. Oh, the Pastor Dan's a crummy swimmer. Look, he had to be rescued by a lifeguard. Look, they towed him out of there. I don't want that scene. So, anyway. Point others to the rescuer. Because some, some people don't want to, they, they don't want to be rescued. So what, I, what do we do? We pray faithfully for the people in your life who need to be rescued. Pray this. Pray, pray John 6 verse 44. Remember Jesus said, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him to myself. Pray that. Say, God, I pray that you would draw this person to yourself. And that word draw there doesn't mean, oh, I'm, I'm just pulling. That means drag. Drag to him. God's going to, God, please drag this person to yourself. We pray that we pray the truth of Scripture. Pray the, pr the truth of John 16. Remember, Jesus said, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is going to come and judge and uh, convict the world of three things. Sin, unbelief, and, right uh, and righteousness. Lord, convict, convict my friend of sin. Convict him that, that he or she 
Sins all the time before a holy God. Lord, convict him. Show my, per my friend that his righteousness is like filthy rags before a holy God. Help my friend to see that one day, you're not going to die and have a party in hell with your friends, but one day you're going to die, and apart from Christ, you are going to be, face the judgment of God. Pray that. Pray that for our friends. Pray faithfully for the people in your life who need to be rescued. Two, be a proactive questioner. Ask people for permission to ask them a question. Okay, so. <clears throat> Sorry. What do I mean by proactive questioner? It's this. Sometimes we're too involved in looking at this to be involved in the lives of other people. You know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? Sometimes we're involved in our technology so much that we, don't, we can't even have a talk with a person. You can't even have a talk with your neighbor. You can't have a talk with people. Holy cow. Oh, oh, Siri, ask my friend a question. No, you ask your friend a question, you know? So be proactive in having conversations with people. Be proactive in having a conversation. You can just even ask one question. Hey, can I ask you one question before you go? Oh, what's that question? Where are you on your spiritual journey? And then from that question can leap um, not leap, but can grow a conversation that leads to other things. Remember, years ago, there was a group called Evangelism Explosion. They had these two question mark lapels that people wore around, and, and they, 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 they still have these things, but so they had these two question marks, and you go, hey, Kenny, what's those two question marks mean that you're wearing? Oh, these two question marks represent two very significant questions that I like to ask people. Oh, what are those questions? Oh, the questions are this. Do you know for sure where you're going to, um, do you know for sure that you're going to go to be with God in heaven when you die? And the second question is this, if God were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? Now, you don't, you don't see those pins around very much anymore because unfortunately in our culture, people aren't, aren't at that point where they're thinking about God as often as they used to. So you have to back, backtrack a little bit and maybe ask a different question. But be proactive, be inquisitive, be interested in what people believe. Okay? Engage them in conversation. Oh, but I'm an introvert, Pastor Dennis. You know what? Introverts can ask a question. You know, it doesn't matter if you're introvert, extrovert, whatrovert, whatever. Be a proactive questioner. And thirdly, I say this. Persistently go the extra mile to share Jesus with people. Go the extra mile to share Jesus with people. So, I was having a garage sale at my house a couple of Saturdays ago, okay? And I put on my Craigslist ad, oh, you know, comic books, blah, 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 knickknacks, et cetera. So, midway in the morning, a little old lady came and she goes, where's the knickknacks? I go, oh, knickknacks. Oh, over here in this box, there's knickknacks over here. Oh, okay, so she's looking through the knickknacks and she makes a statement to me. She goes, well, actually, I go, what's your name? She goes, oh, my name's B. Oh, I'm Dennis. She cans. And then she goes, you know, if there is a hurricane that hits your house, do not go in your house because you'll die. Really? Why do you think that? Because you're hurt. These houses up here in Makikil are not hurricane proof for this type of hurricane. So do not go there. Go to a, a shelter nearby and you'll be safe. I said, B, thank you so much for sharing that information with me. That's very helpful to know, to know that. I was a little skeptical, but when she shared that with me, I think my... But anyway, long story short, B bought some knickknacks. She left. Ten minutes later, B comes back. B comes back, and she comes up to me. She goes, oh, here. Here's some information on hurricanes in Hawaii. I want you to read it so that you can know more about the potential threat of hurricane hitting a house and where you could go to be to have shelter, because most of the shelters here in Makakilo will not keep you safe. You've got to go all the way. Where do you work? I said, I work here at the church. Oh, that's probably a safe place you can go. Anyway, she went home and she got that paperwork, then bring it back to me, because she was very concerned that if a hurricane hits and I went to my house and my family, we we're all going to die. Yeah? God bless B. So B, the knick-knack hurricane warning lady. She challenged my life. She challenged I was thinking about how, how, how strange that conversation was. But you know what? She challenged me. She goes, if a woman, if a person can have a message like that and be so filled with passion to share it, how about me? What about us? Yeah? 
We got this, the most wonderful message you, a person could ever hear. So I just ask, let's be persistent in sharing with our friends. Hey, with people. You know, they, they might not like, hey, that guy's weird. I don't really, I don't care, you know. I don't care if people think, you're, think I'm weird. Maybe they think you're weird, but, well, but it, it doesn't matter. Okay? So, my friends, we look at the life of David today. David was used to rescue his people, not just this time, but other times during the course of his life. David was a rescuer. David points us to our ultimate need for the, Jesus, the ultimate rescuer. So my challenge for, you, for us today, one, embrace the rescuer. If you haven't already embraced the rescuer and said, I need to be saved from this life that I'm living, embrace him today. And two, point others to that rescuer. Point others to Jesus. Be creative in thinking how you're going to do that. God has given us so many ways, right, to be creative to do that. Be creative. Write your compassion children. Say, hey, here's the rescuer. Although they're hearing about the rescuer anyway through compassion. But, you know, it's little things like that. Embrace your rescuer. And having done that, let us continually point others to the rescuer. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that your spirit, the spirit that was in David is in us, and that you will lead us into conversations. You will lead us into having relationships with people. You will lead us into opportunities to help people know the rescuer. We thank you, Lord, that we can embrace Jesus Christ as our rescuer today. We thank you for eternal life, the gift of eternal life that we can have today through Christ. And I ask, Lord, that you would just open the box, open many opportunities up for us this week, tomorrow, today, to point others to you. Help us to be proactive in ask, asking questions. Help us to be persistent in helping to share with people about you. And Lord God, help us to pray. That's the most important thing we can do, is pray. Pray that people would be convicted of their need for a rescuer. In Jesus' name we pray.